Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the second half of the first day of the E-Frames Fikri 2020. Uh, we have with us two eminent personalities for the next session. Introducing uh, Mr. Suzanne Shuwats, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of SLFRA Back Limited, who will be in conversation with the, Mr. Mark Reed, the CEO of WPP. Mr. Suzanne Shu, the platform is all yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And if some of you are dialing from other parts of the world, good morning uh, and, and, and a good evening to you if you are in the Asian pack part of the world. So a very, very good afternoon and good evening. Uh, and it is indeed my pleasure to be here today. Uh, I I'll first start by thanking Fiki, uh, the organizers, Lina Jasani in particular from Fiki, and my friend Srini from WPP for reaching out and giving me this opportunity. As you know, the title of this year's uh, E-Fiki Frames is How Technology Can Help Media and Entertainment Take the Next Leap. There couldn't have been a better time to choose a title like that. And it is indeed technology which is helping us to reach out to you. But more importantly, I am very excited about the hour uh, or so ahead and this session because my friend Mark Reed is indeed one of the finest person to talk about technology and digital. It is indeed my pleasure, Mark, to have you on this session. I, I know Mark does not need any introduction but it would be inappropriate if I don't take a couple of minutes to, to say a few things about Mark Reed. Mark Reed, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, is the CEO of WPP since September 2018. Mark has had several roles uh, and has had a long stint with WPP. He was the executive director there for about nine years, head of strategy and CEO of WPP Digital for over 12 years. And I think it is the role of CEO as WPP Digital that I wanted to spend uh, you know, a little bit time on. I think this is where he helped the company move into technology and change gears by the acquisition of 24 by 7 Real Media and creation of data-driven creative network called Possible. Mark took over as a global CEO of Wonderman in 2015 and transformed that agency to world's leading creative data and technology agency in the you know one of the leading creative agencies and in november 2018 wonderman merged with jwt to, fo to form what is called wonderman thompson wonderman thompson today is one of the largest agencies with a global provider of end-to-end -end solutions with 20,000 people operating in 90 markets and serving some marquee clients to name a few Microsoft, Dell, Shell, HSBC, BT, Adidas. You can see a wide variety there. But Mark, one thing you will see about Mark, and that's why I think this hour is so exciting for me and I'm sure for all of you ladies and gentlemen, is the underlying theme on digital and technology. Mark was named Heroes Champion of Women in Business List for 2018 and 2019. Heroes spelled with capital H-E-R. Mark is a big champion of diversity. He's helped mentor and train women to climb through the talent pipeline. This is one area, Mark, I totally relate to you. Uh, I also had the distinction of getting the UN badge of he for she. And I think diversity, I'm a big believer in diversity myself. So it, it is indeed a pleasure talking to another fellow uh, person who is so, so, so uh, to, to a friend who's so committed to diversity. Mark, ladies and gentlemen, is an MBA from INSEAD, a BA in economics from Trinity College, and was Henry Fellow at Harvard University. Uh, he was amongst the 25 digital influencers in Europe, named by the Wired magazine in 2014. And he's also been the drums digital individual of the year for two years, 2015 and 2017. Mark lives in London with his wife and two children. Mark, once again, a pleasure to, to be here with you and to do this in remote. I'm sitting in Mumbai. It's, it's, a, it's a rainy, windy day here. And I know you are in London and you are in office while I'm sitting at home. But, and, and we are doing this e -E conference, one of the largest e, -E conferences in media and entertainment. Yeah. So That's let nice me start you, with... Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Sorry. No, no, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm in the office, as you say, um, for the second day in a row. Um, actually, the second day since March. 
So yeah. we all went home, I guess, about um, the 13th, 14th of March. And um, so in the office of the second day, I think there's 10 of us in a building built for 2,500 people. So um, we're, we're definitely coming back um, gradually. But it feels good, I'd say, I have to say, although it's been fantastic, um, you know, the way people have worked the last three months, it also feels good to be back in an office. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Mark. I was myself in office last on 16th of March. I haven't stepped into an office after that. I'm hoping to be in office by mid-July, hopefully. Yeah. Again, as you said, with very few people, but we'll begin the journey uh, as we go. And I think this uh, aptly segues into the first question, which is on top of the mind of the audience and for everyone. I think with COVID-19 pandemic, the unprecedented times that we are living in, Mark, you are at a vantage point to be able to see what is happening across the world. So my first question to you is from a global perspective. I would request you to talk about where do you see uh, the world headed, uh, especially the economy in, in near term and medium term, uh, the impact it has had on different clients. And I think, you know, it has had a varying degree of impact depending on which category you're operating in. And maybe if you could touch upon also what you think on how media segments will evolve post COVID-19 as we go to the new normal. Um, so when I say media segments, I'm talking about a conventional segments like print, television, digital, yeah. and, and therefore the interplay between these and, and, and the future for these at a global level. So uh, over to you, Mark. Yeah, I, look, I think um, at, a, at a sort of overall macro level, I mean, the last statistics I saw for the global economy from JP Morgan were you know, a 4.0% decline in 2020 and a 5.1% growth in 2021. So in theory, you know, next year we get back to the levels or actually slightly above the levels we were in, in 2019. So I'd say that, that at, a, at a macro level is rather encouraging. Um, within the US, um, it's, a similar, it's a similar pattern. And actually China which should show 2% growth this year and 6% growth next year. So China sort of continues to grow through it. The UK, where I am, is one of the worst affected economies, a 9% decline this year and only a 7% uh, pick up next year. So 2021 next year will still be below the levels we were last year. I mean, that covers then obviously the quarterly pattern. You know, I think that you know, Q2 appears so far to have been the worst impacted quarter. And people are expecting quite a strong bounce back in Q3. In fact, some people are saying that Q3 will show the strongest economic acceleration on record. I guess after Q2 showed the strongest economic decline in record, um, <laughs> it's somewhat, somewhat reassuring. Um, so I think we will see you know, a relatively good bounce back in, in economic activity. But I, I, I sort of subscribe to the view that this is more of a kind of a, a Nike swoosh, a, a gradual bounce back or a gradual recovery. I mean, that's certainly what we've seen um, in markets that have come out of the lockdown. I think people are uh, rightly cautious and rightly anxious. And, you know, consumer spending doesn't just bounce back quickly. I think it takes time for the economy. Now, in, in some sectors, they're sort of pent up demand. And if I look at it sector by sector, you know, clearly consumer packaged goods, healthcare, technology, which is about 54% of WPP's revenue, has been relatively resilient. You know, I think spending has been, you know, it, clearly it's been impacted, but it's been relatively resilient. But at the other end, you have categories like luxury, travel and tourism and automotive, which has been significantly impacted. Now, as we come out of the recovery, I think, again, we see, you know, a, a, a differential return by sector. Actually, automotive has bounced back pretty, pretty strongly in the US. You know, May, June, you've seen year on year, increase in demand for cars. We saw the similar picture in, in China. But in the main, I think that, um, you know, consumers are looking at their spend in, um, in different categories. And you'll see um, you know, greater resilience, continuing packaged goods. But I think large discretionary items will take some time to pick up. And perhaps we can talk about it later. Things like restaurants and travel I think will take significant time for consumers to pick up confidence. Now, when you translate that into what happens in the media market, I think you see, you know, a global decline this year, and then you see a pickup next year of about the same amount. I think in the US, we're expecting a 13% decline this year, and around a pickup of about the same amount. And that's sort of roughly kind of what we're seeing 
globally. But within that, obviously, there's a big differential sector by sector. And uh, traditional media, you know, television, broadcast television, print, uh, have clearly been uh, most impacted. You know, cinema and out of home, for obvious reasons, um, have probably been the worst affected media. But you're seeing a lot of continued pressure on, on broadcast television, despite the increases in, in viewing numbers in most parts of the world. Te traditional television viewing is up anywhere from 40 to 80 percent. Uh, local news viewing, you know, even in India, has doubled over the last three to four months. So we're seeing, you know, continued pressure on uh, on broadcast television and 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 a shift to uh, to digital media, really an acceleration of a shift to digital media. And I think one way to think about this pandemic is it has uh, continued to accelerate the changes that are taking place in society. And perhaps that's some of that is what we can what we can talk about. No, absolutely. I think uh, coming to this uh, question of with the growth in uh, television viewing, I think advertising, once the uh, economy sort of normalizes or sort of comes back to the new normal, as they say, um, do you see advertising again bouncing back with the same rate, Mark, or...? You know, so I think aggregate advertising spend will bounce back. I think that the biggest difference is um, changes in consumer behavior, which I think are resilient. You know, certainly we saw um, in the US and the UK uh, in 08, 09, a massive decline in newspaper advertising and a big decline in newspaper reading, subscriptions and purchases. And that spend never came back. Um, and, I, and I think one of the challenges here has been that... Um, you know, as, as, as our clients get used to driving demand through digital channels, they're not going to go back to traditional media at the same pace, you know, or at the same level. So I think that we will see some persistence of the decline in uh, traditional media and a continued acceleration in growth in, in digital media. And by the way, if you look at the valuation of technology stocks in the USA, that's, you know, you can see that's what's happened. You know, the overall, in aggregate, the market has come down. But the market cap has really shifted from the traditional sectors of the economy to the new sectors of the economy, to Alphabet, Microsoft, Apple, you know, Tesla and automotive. Um, so I think that, you know, as investors look at you know, long term growth trends and see this as an acceleration of the trends benefiting those businesses. Yeah. So that segues into my next uh, question, Mark. And I think, you know, from what you said. One other peculiar phenomenon we are seeing this time around in this crisis is the divergence between how the markets are performing and how the economy is going. So your perspective on that, because it's sort of leaving a few people quite bewildered as to markets continue to do uh, rather volatile, but continue to do very well, whereas economy, as we know, is nowhere near recovery at the moment, at least. Yeah, in fact, I think that most chief executives look at the financial markets in aggregate, maybe, maybe not their own share price, but they certainly look at the financial markets in aggregate and, you know, scratch their level at the level, scratch their head at the level of the financial market relative to the performance of, of their own businesses. You know, I think, you know, one explanation is that if a company is valued at 10 times earnings and it loses one year, you know, it's only one out of 10, right? And so yeah. I think, you know, part of that, if this is just a blip, and we power through it, then I, I, you can understand some of the valuations. And I think there's a feeling that, you know, the support from central banks, you know, particularly in the United States and from governments has been so substantial that, you know, companies will continue to come through this strongly um, the other side. Now, I think, you know, we do worry about the hangover in the UK. We have eight to nine people effectively having their salaries paid for by the government. That's going to start to expire you know, in August and September. In the US, you see a significant fiscal stimulus. And actually, there are people in the US who are probably better off in the current environment than they were, you know, pre pre pandemic. So I think that the, the, the question is, you know, who's going to pay for all the stimulus? But that's a different question from what props up, you know, share prices and financial markets, which are really driven by liquidity. And I think that you've seen, you know, the amount of liquidity pumped into the economy, a uh, much greater resilience amongst corporates. You know, the level of corporate failure is not substantial, even in sectors, you know, really severely impacted because of a level of government um, support and a level of funding and liquidity 
available to companies around the world. And so I think the government has in the main done a good job at uh, keeping the economy going. Uh, but how we get ourselves off that sort of drip, I think is going to be the, the key question. Yeah, I mean, the other thing, uh, which is, uh, you know, when we talk of media and entertainment, one of the really growing sectors has been sports and, you know, uh, around the world and more so in India as well. So uh, I think with, with this pandemic, uh, what do you think of, uh, you know, um, the big sporting tournaments coming back? What's your view globally and, and what's your thought on how this could play out in India as well? particularly for a tournament like IPL? Yeah, look, I think that um, I, I don't think that the passion for sports will be diminished by, you know, one year of absence. You know, we've been through periods before where, you know, Olympic Games have been cancelled and sports have not taken place. And I think um, people's enthusiasm is not in any way um, diminished. So I think we have to deal with a difficult year for sports around the world and clients are looking for alternative properties. You know, I think there's a theory in it. I have some merit in it that esports will grow. Um, but I think that, again, that's an acceleration of a trend that was already taking place. And there's really massive growth in esports and in, com in, in computer games that I think will, will continue. We can debate whether or not they're real sports. So that's a, a different um a different discussion but i've no doubt that the ipl will be back you know here in the uk we're starting to play you know premiership football games without spectators you know it's perfectly possible um and you know it, it's not the same experience and i'm sure regular fans miss out um you've seen people do you know fun things uh, creative ideas to make the games more engaging you know remote cheering and putting photos of yourself uh, in the stadium, we saw that with a client in, in Australia. So there are ways of getting fans engaged. But I think we have to get the sort of the games back being played in, in a safe way. I think we'll have to see what happens to the Tokyo Olympics next year. It's not entirely clear that without a vaccine um, that the games can take place. I think it's going to be very difficult without a vaccine to see how in practice they can take place. Um, but then news around a vaccine, you know, continues to be, I'd say, relatively, relatively positive. So, you know, I've no doubt that um, sports will be back and people will be you know, cheering and sponsors will be uh, investing behind them before, as soon as we can play the game safely. Yeah, the Fre I think French Open has announced new dates uh, around September, I think late September sometime and all that. So I think it's interesting, particularly tennis is one game, which which could, there are different types of games again. I think there will be segregation in the type of games and there are some yeah. which can be played um, uh, more easily. I think even with spectators compared to others, I think, you know, that's the, and uh, that's a challenge. No, I think, uh, so some of my uh, folks uh, listening to, to this would also be thinking about what would be the case with IPL. Uh, and I think there is, of course, as you said, it will come back definitely in its full form sooner than later, but it could even be played in a more curtailed fashion towards towards the end of this year. I think this then perfectly segues into, Mark, uh, some questions from my end on India then. So everything which we yeah. talked about uh, from a global perspective, if I could ask you, uh, you know, what is WPP uh, seeing, what what are you seeing it in India and what's your, what are your thoughts for India? I think both from a client perspective and also the different media segments, because I think India tends to behave a little differently um, from the world, especially in media segments and sometimes even in, in, in customer segments. So, um, you know, if I could understand from you the impact on India and, and what is it that the what is that you are seeing and, and what are the, what are your thoughts for the companies here in India? Yeah, so I, I think, look, I think the first thing to say is, um, you know, we remain extremely positive about the long term growth prospects for the for the Indian economy. And um, for, for India overall, we have seven or 8,000 people in India, you know, mainly in, in Mumbai and Gurgaon, uh, but a, a spread across the country as well. And so it's been challenging for them. You know, we sent them all home to work from home on March 16th, so just before the lockdown. And I think they've done you know, a fantastic job continuing to work from clients uh, from home and remotely, and we're getting work made and, and, and work done. I think as ever with India, things to some extent a little bit more extreme in India than they are in other parts of the world. And I think yeah. we've seen that 
um, you know, in, in some of the response and certainly in advertising spend. And, uh, you know, I think that talks to both the nature of the Indian economy and the resilience and entrepreneurship of Indians. You know, it's a, it's a, a nation of people used to managing in uncertainty. And I have no doubt that, you know, people can do it. We saw coming into the year, we expected ad spend to be up about 13 uh, percent, but it was already impacted by the first quarter down 5 percent. And actually, we saw April 2020, our estimates of overall ad spend were down 82 percent. That's pretty significant. And I would say probably one of the most severe uh, reactions we've seen uh, anywhere in the world. Now, if it was 82 in April, we saw 65 in May. And our estimate for June is around down around about 50 percent. So I'd say Indian advertising expenditure has been um, much more impacted. I mean, even here in the UK, we saw ITV ad spend down 40 to 50 percent, not not down sort of 50 to 80 percent. Um, because of the, 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 the pace of the decline, uh, a, a pace of uptake. And more, more, more broadly um, in India, again, I think we are seeing many of the same shifts we saw in other parts of the world, you know, shift to time spent online, uh, an increase in uh, aspects like, you know, online food delivery or shopping applications. We've seen good growth in those areas. You know, people are spending more money on, sort of consumer staples and less money on discretionary goods like cosmetics or confectionery and obviously a massive drop uh, in the sale of alcoholic alcoholic drinks. And as we think about the recovery, you start to see people, you know, I like to think about the recovery in three phases. You know, there's, there's react, what happened when the pandemic hit, uh, recover and then renew. And I think we're seeing, you know, India very much in the sort of the recover and, and renew phase, and people start to think about what they want to do when they come out uh, when, as the lockdown ends. Now, it's interesting, when you see, when you ask people what they want to do, the number one thing people want to do is get their hair cut. <laughs> 36% of people want to visit a, um, want to visit a hairdresser, a hairdresser. Uh, and so uh, what they don't want to do, interestingly, is, is go, to a, go to a restaurant. So, you know, you see going getting a haircut within three months, you know, taking a taxi and within six months sort of buying a new computer, the number one thing people want to do. Things people don't expect to do is go to a restaurant, um, go out to the movies or fly, you know, either you know, domestically or international. So I think that the behaviours that are deemed to be less safe are still quite a long way down people's agenda. Now, we have seen... Um, we saw a tremendous anxiety at the beginning of the pandemic. You know, 96% of Indians were concerned that they'd be worse off. Uh, that's starting to diminish, and we're seeing you know, attributes like sort of calm and trust build, and, and, and attributes like anxiety decline. So it's clear um, that the Indian consumer is in a somewhat better place. And when you talk to them about what they want to do, there's a number of habits that will continue. You know, this has to some extent been the period of greatest reflection in human history, you know, three months of sort of self-enforced reflection. So people want to you know, lead healthier lifestyles, uh, exercise more, spend more time with their family, continue to work remotely. And I think we will see some evidence, you know, that those behaviours will uh, persist after the, after the pandemic. So people have uh, used this time to, to do better things. But I, I don't think that we're going to see a rush um, for people to you know, go, go, go out for meals. And when you look at what people look, say they want to spend money on India, actually a big preference towards buying locally to Indian goods, whether made by a Western company or an Indian company, but I think a preference to sort of trusted brands and actually particularly uh, Indi Indian brands as well. So I think that we'll see, like we saw in, in other parts of the world, um, you know, a, a, a shift and, you know, the immediate recovery in personal cleaning, um, health, personal grooming, beverages, and then aspects like holidays, luxury goods, vehicle purchases will be, you know, really quite delayed. That's very interesting. Um, 
the uh, i also want to uh, ladies and gentlemen and to the audience i think the e audience here i just wanted to let you know we want the session to be conversational uh, we want to communicate with you so do send in your questions uh, we will we will uh, you know try and respond to as many of them as we can so uh, type in your questions uh, i hope it is open um, you know my request to lena and the others who are sort of um, are doing this uh, we would request we would uh, you know want questions to come in so that we can uh, answer some of these um, as we go forward and i think so we can make it more interactive i think on the consumer behavior and you talked about it uh, mark uh, already quite a lot uh, yeah but um, are there any um, you know um, and and while you've touched upon it but are there three defining uh, trends which you would like to sort of you know um Uh, talk about and then uh, I, I, is that is uh, do you have enough data? I know through Kanta, you guys also are, are are getting a lot of data from around the world. So, are there a couple of maybe two to three defining trends which are which are a departure from the past or or further acceleration of something which was happening just before the pandemic? Yeah, I, look, I think that most of the things that are happening are uh, accelerations of things that were happening. Around the time of the pandemic, you know, clearly the biggest trend is the shift uh, online. So it's hard to think of um, part of the economy or part of society that has not moved online, whether it's uh, shopping or payment or education um, and many activities. From um, I mean, the fact that we can run WPP with one hundred and seven thousand people around the world, you know, really online and create work for clients. Shows you know what what can be done. You know, my kids have spent the last three months being homeschooled online. If you talk to people in other sectors, you know, um, I was from somebody in the art industry. You know, art you know art auctions used to be take take place in you know buildings with people with hammers, and actually it's all moved online very smoothly, and that opens up new growth opportunities for 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 companies to think in different ways. So I think that. Um, People need to think radically differently about a society where many, many more things are happening online. It takes, um, it breaks down distance. So, you know, we ha- we've offshored work in the past. Um, you know, much of it to India, where we have very successful production facilities. When everyone's working remotely, your company in India is is around the corner as the person that you need you used to sit next to. So, I think it opens up new opportunities, and I think it, it has implications for. Um, Businesses and and quite frankly for governments who are thinking about how they need to uh, shift the economy. If you think about those three phases of react, recover, and renew, we ne- we need to think really hard about renewal. You know how are we going to renew our business for what they call this the new normal, whatever the new normal is. I think by the time we get back to normal, we'll have forgotten what normal was when we started to some extent. You know, our, our expectation is that we'll bring people back gradually to our offices, and probably we will end up at seventy to eighty percent capacity. Now, by implication, that means we need twenty to thirty percent less office space. Now, some of that may be in the short term taken up by social distancing, but in the long term, the big implication for office space. I think certainly in developed markets like the UK and the US, when retail reopens. You know, one in five retailers may never reopen. So there's big implications for you know retail. How can you repurpose high streets? How can you repurpose shopping malls? Do you convert them into you know accommodation or different types of space? Um, I think that some parts of the economy are going to take a long, longer, as you said, to to recover. So uh, you know, I I think that um, the digitization of the world. You know, we have this notion that. Every company is really a technology company, and WPP needs to be a technology company. Is very much in our mind as we think about WPP. It's really how we put technology at the heart of everything that we do, and how we help our clients, you know, navigate from how they used to market and connect with their consumers to how they need to market and connect with their with their consumers uh, in the future. No, no, absolutely. You know. Um... Indians are are uh, big shoppers, as you know, Mark, and and they are very fond of London and Oxford Street. So as I was listening to you, I was thinking, I think the next visit to London, I think the visit to London will happen for sure. I think for the for the beautiful city it is, but maybe Oxford Street and Regent Street may get redefined 
and I think would they be they could be an e versions of them. So you spot you know you do part part of those not necessarily going to those streets but in some other form. So I think that's that's really interesting. And I think uh, I one other question before we start taking the audience questions is you talked about this strategic concept of react, recover, and renew. And I thought I'll take this opportunity for you to sort of uh, you know if you could build on it. And I think you know talk a little bit more to the audience on on how you are looking at. Uh, at the world and, and arguably India as well on on react recover and renew. Yeah, I think that um, I mean to some extent what what we're trying to do at WPP uh, ourselves and how we're trying to reshape the company talks to some of that. You know, really, you know, putting technology at the heart of what we want to do. You, know, you mentioned at the beginning bringing you know fantastic brands like J. Walter Thompson and Wonderman together to form sort of integrated businesses that are more client centric. And not organized, you know, Jay Walter Thompson around sort of analog media channels and Wonderman around digital media channels, but businesses organized really around clients and ideas. So I think companies are going to think about, about their structure and how they can put technology uh, at the heart of this uh, much more than they're doing at the moment. You know, we're working now with uh, airlines, thinking how we can get airlines back flying in a safe way. And I think airlines are going to have to think about you know, what they're going to do in much more limited. Um, demand for air travel, certainly I'd argue on a three to five year uh, outlook compared to where we are. And I think that a lot of business travel, you know, may, may never come back. You know, that has implications for um, the size and shape of aeroplanes. You know, you've seen um, Boeing announce yesterday that they're, st they're stopping making uh, the 747. And I read somewhere there's only 30 747s flying around the world, given uh, the change in demand. So I think that if you think about every industry, it has its own course to think through and, and, and work out uh, what it's going to be. Certainly for um, other sectors, you know, like luxury goods, we need to start to think through, are they going to sell online? You know, online sales has been a big barrier for luxury goods companies that believe you need to have a face-to-face -face selling experience to really create the luxury experience. I would argue that the fact that they haven't been able to sell really at all for the last three to four months is going to put much more demand on them to think about what is an online luxury experience, you know, what elements of physical and offline, physical and digital does it combine? It probably won't just be a digital experience, um, but it probably will be uh, much more balanced. So I think companies are going to have to start to think and invest more in technology. And interestingly, what we haven't seen uh, is companies cut back on big sort of transformation and technology transformation efforts. If anything, we've seen some of our clients accelerate those um, initiatives. You may have seen, you know, Walgreens Boots in the US announced a big technology partnership with Microsoft, a uh, multi-million dollar partnership to accelerate its digital transformation. So even at a time when things are difficult, I think far-sighted companies are taking you know, long-term decisions to uh, invest in technology and really rethink uh, their footprint, and it's causing them to take, you know, look at things like their retail footprint and make tough decisions that perhaps should have been taken some time ago, but, but you know, they can't avoid it today. No, no, I absolutely agree with you. I think, you know, um, this digital transformation and, 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 the, and it was already happening before the pandemic, but I think the pace at which it is going to happen now um, is, is something which we should all gear up for. It's a transformation we should embrace and we should be ready to take on board rather than resist because I think uh, that's, that, that is going to be one of the defining things as we go forward. We've already start, started receiving some questions. Uh, so let me take one question, Mark, uh, the first one from the audience. Uh, the question is, in the new normal, and it's from Prashant, uh, in the new normal and consumer behavior, uh, how do you think viewing habits will change? Uh, and do you anticipate change in the choice of content? So I think, you know, what, what we've seen is a much greater demand uh, for, we've seen growth, frankly, in all media consumption, because people have been, you know, locked, locked, locked up at home, many with, many with less to do. I, I think when we come out, um, we'll see, you know, a shift to um, digital channels. You know, one of, one of the challenges facing, I'd say, certainly traditional broadcasters is many of the sort of, um, you know, many of the, 
the, the things that they relied on, you know, sports, live events, t- you know, TV shows, certainly in Western markets, they haven't been able to make at the same rate. So you're seeing a shift to uh, Netflix and to other subscription video on demand services uh, at the expense of uh, traditional broadcasters. So I think that there will be um, that continued uh, structural shift in media consumption on digital channels and that will accelerate and as it accelerates um, advertising dollars and uh, subscription money will follow those channels and I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on uh, traditional broadcasters as, as a result. Some of that true in India, maybe less pronounced in India given the growth in the market but certainly true in other markets. No, no, absolutely and I think Prashant just to build on what Mark said I think especially for media and entertainment and for content, I think one of the big trends which COVID has brought and it, and has accelerated, and Mark spoke about it just a couple of minutes back, is breaking down barriers and breaking down distances and breaking down. So in the past, when we would think of media, we would think of a market. We would think of the catchment area. And you would say, you know, particularly for events and so on and so forth. But in general, I think what we need to now start thinking is thinking of a, a world which is which has got no barriers and therefore i think it's content which we make which should which, which should be of high quality and i think what pipe and what medium it finds is therefore secondary particularly for content creators content creators should focus on high quality content and i think uh, that trend is going to further get accentuated there is little room for for the medium i think that's the for the average is what i would i would add on to that uh, I think. I mean, all, all I'd say, Sadashi, is if I look at my own kids, they watch uh, a tremendous amount of average media. I mean, they spend quite happily two or three hours watching YouTube videos. You know, average cost of production, ten to twenty dollars an hour, if that, if that. So I think you're seeing a sort of a polarization of a polarization of consumption. I think what's really, you know, what's really interesting is certainly. Um, I think in a lot of markets where you know, kids are getting connected on iPads and other devices sort of for the first time and to some extent probably younger than they have been in the past. Um, I've seen a lot of um, you know, connectivity, uh, apps like House Party and apps that connect you while you're playing games. So I think it's a tremendous volume of connection. And so you know, I think the, there will be a polarization of content creation, both at the high end and, and, and then volume uh, at, at the low end. Yes. Uh, the second question from the audience, which we have, uh, Mark, is uh, a very specific question on WPP. I think uh, it's asking, what is your view on the Indian market for WPP for the next six months? And Ganpati is asking this question. Yeah, so look, I think that clearly... Um, you know, no, no company is immune from the, you know, the economic impact um, of the pandemic. And so I think in the short term, you know, things, things are going to be tough um, for, for our business uh, in India. I think we expect to get people gradually back into the office when, uh, when measures relax. But I think we're very focused on keeping our people safe. So we're not rushing people back um, into work. And actually, um, it, it's been fantastic to see what people have done, given where they are. We're investing in a new uh, production hub. Uh, we call it Bay 99 Studios. And that's a really important part of us, you know, being able to produce content for our clients, you know, quickly and cheaply that goes across uh, all channels. So we continue to um, invest in the Indian market. We were there actually, um, our executive committee was actually in, in India, I guess, three weeks before the lockdown. It was the, my last trip um, abroad, uh, before we were locked down and we spent um, three or four days with Srini and the team uh, in, in Mumbai and met a number of our clients, you know, all of whom I think at that time, um, I don't think people fully expected to happen what has happened now. Um, but I'd say there was some cautiousness, but not where we, not, not, not where we are. So I think that, um, you know, what, what we're really looking to do is, you know, help clients with that gradual recovery, identifying areas of demand, you know, building occasions for their products, helping them to communicate in the right way. You know, consumers need you know, reassurance, need to understand what clients are doing for them. 
I think India's always been a very socially responsible country, and we've done a lot of work with the government around mask force and mask wearing. And I think that um, we're very proud of the efforts we've done in that in that area as well. And then I and I think that um, we're going to continue to uh, help clients, you know, come back, get the right balance of creative message between you know, being uh, appropriate and communicating the functionality that, that people need uh, at, at the moment. Yeah. In, uh, uh, there is also uh, uh, this thing of basically creating solutions for client, uh, Mark, which is what, you know, um, which WPP had started doing. So any thoughts in that area? Would you like to elaborate a bit on that piece? You mean working across WPP? Yes, yes. I mean, look, our, our vision for WPP is, you know, we set out to be a, a creative transformation company. So creative means we're in the business of ideas and innovation and growth, which I think is what clients need to succeed, what they've always needed, but what they'll need even more than ever as they come out of the pandemic. You know, how do they, uh, you, know, you know, we'll see, um, you know, people will be very differently affected by this. There'll be some people who will be, you know, de delighted. There are some people who will be financially worse off. There are some people who would have lost loved ones. I mean, we can't forget that you know, more than half a million people around the world have known to have died uh, so far. And that number you know, is only sadly increasing. So I think understanding uh, consumer behavior will be, will be critical. So you know, as a company, we're really focused on creativity. Secondly, we're focused on transformation. So how we help clients you know, market from how they used to market to how they need to market in the future. And then lastly, we want to be a company. A company means we operate as we can as one. So while we'll have strong brands like AKQA or Mindshare or Ogilvy or Wonderman Thompson, we also want people to be able to work together. And I think clients do want to have uh, what I would call silo-less solutions. And so increasingly what we're doing for our clients is putting teams together. We're eliminating duplication. We're taking down barriers. We're enabling them to work in a much more agile fashion. We're letting them share data. We're putting in common technology platforms and common technology systems. We have creative teams that work together to come up with ideas that work across all, all of the channels. And I think that gives clients uh, a much better answer to what they need to do, you know, particularly bringing creative and media and production and, and public relations and social media together. And I think that um, you know, in India, and like other markets, uh, if we can get that working and we are getting that working in a very agile and fast fashion, I think that will be really important to our clients as they come out of this situation. Thank you. I think one of the spe very specific questions from the audience, from uh, Namita Koshi, is how are you seeing outdoor media? Yes, well, I think, you know, clearly um, outdoor has been challenged by the fact that in many parts of the world, people are not outdoor if you to be to be candid um you know look we, you know three months ago in london it was deserted today it feels like it's 80 percent back to normal like, you know I, I don't have the uh benefit of having been in mumbai or delhi to see what what it's like there but i think you know outdoor media will come back i think that the the the, the, the the growth of digital outdoor media though i think is really interesting it offers the ability to target messages more precisely by audiences, by time of day, to be much more responsive to events and to you know, measure the impact much more carefully. And so I think that, um, you know, like other parts of the economy, the outdoor industry needs to move online and provide clients with much you know, faster ways of uh, changing their creative and adapting it than it has done uh, historically. And then the cost of that may be prohibitive in some parts of the world. But I think that, that um, we'll see that uh, re really start to drive continued growth in outdoor. And this will be something of a blip, but sort of broad-based brand awareness media, I still think will be needed in this world. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah, Namita. I think, you know, so outdoor will come back. You see India as well. You know, the big cities, people are slowly coming out again. But I think, um, as Mark said, you know, making it digital um, would make it more measurable, would be able to make, you know, you would be able to change faster and you will be able to customize uh, solutions. I think that's the need of the R and I think that needs to be done like for many other industries. The other question which is there, um, Mark, this time from a person called Ligia Matthews, 
Um, I think it's, an, it's a good question. Uh, you see, with this online, big online phenomena, which you spoke about and which I fully agree, uh, there is a worry at, at people's, uh, at the back of their mind is what happens to sustainability? Are we going to be using too much of, so therefore from a packaging point of view, from the delivery point of view, so your reflections on that. So the question is what happens to sustainability and the environment as we go forward? I, look, I think, I mean, I think um, it should, in, theoretically, it should improve sustainability. I mean, if we're, if we're reading an electronic newspaper compared to buying a paper newspaper, it, sh it should be better for the environment, particularly if we can generate energy from renewable sources. Now, I'm, I would say I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist generally. Um, I think you have to be an optimist to be in business, but I'm an optimist about uh, sustainability and about green energy. I think the, the decline in prices for solar and wind, you know, already um, you know, solar power is cheaper than a coal-fired power station. So I think the decline in prices will give us renewable energy at, uh, or sustainable energy at, at the right price. So I think that with that, we can drive digital adoption should have much less impact on sustainability. I mean, one, one thing you've seen through this pandemic is that, you know, digital payments have been quite resilient and consumers are prepared to pay for services like Spotify. And they've approached a $50 billion market cap now in music. Uh, people are signing up to uh, online you know, subscription services. Uh, so there's a much greater willingness to pay for digital products and services. So I don't think that goes against the sustainability agenda. If anything, it should start to uh, accelerate the sustainable agenda. You know, certainly if I look at um, WPP's carbon footprint, it's going to be much lower in 2020 than it was in 2019. You know, I mean, we're saving significant amounts of money on uh, air travel around the world. And I think that we found out that it can be efficient. You know, historically, to do this event, I would have felt the need to, you know, fly to India, uh, generating a few tons of um, CO2 for my return trip. You know, you realize actually you can do it like this. It may not be 100% as good, but it's probably 95% as good. And it's certainly 100% better for the environment. So I think that we will, um, we will see it just as people have engaged in health and hygiene more at home, probably people will be you know, less willing to go back to uh, the way things were. I'm not sure, Sanjay, you can tell me what the, the smog situation has been like in Mumbai and Delhi, but I think you know, people will be more, uh, will, will want to, to maintain that more than they will be wanting to go back to exactly how it was before. No, you are absolutely right. I think, you know, the, the, the point you made on this office, the, the thing about, you know, working from home, being able to effectively do these things, Mark, I think is, is, is a very good pointer and it is a long-term, uh, long-term really good news from a sustainability point of view. And I think, Ligia, if I could just add one last thing, which is, a, you know, a niggling doubt in many people's mind on the delivery of online. Uh, and let me tell you, as more and more Asian countries go online, particularly very densely populated Asian cities, Mumbai in particular and others, there will be solutions which will come in, which I call omni-channel. So what will happen is you will order online, but the, but the stuff need not flow. Let's say it need not come from Lucknow to Mumbai. It can even come from a, somewhere nearby. So I think, you know, so it's an omni-channel. So it's basically you continue to work online. The trend of online will be very, very, will be predominant. But I think the delivery could be more conventional. So, and I think that is, is uh, that, place to sustainability even further from the point of view of hyper local hyper local delivery on foot yes. right unless yes. they need to involve trucks yes. and everything else yes. and you, look, you see that if you look at if you go to a restaurant in china you can't or you have to order on your telephone but, you yes. know the waiter doesn't take your order so i think that there's many um many many things that um the growth of these devices and new solutions will do in a very interesting way yes uh, one question, uh, Mark, which has come from uh, the Smriti Mishra from Financial Express. And I'll just read out the question um, as is. Uh, I think it's, it's nuanced, but it's an interesting question for you. Even as the next wave in the sector uh, is being driven by digital medium, there, are also sh there is also a shift away from digital, which is where she's talking about Facebook boycott in U.S., 
TikTok ban in India and US also talking about something around TikTok. In such a scenario, what are the advertisers and agency going to look to connect the digital consumer? So look, I, I think clearly, um, uh, despite the shift of digital media, there, there are continues to be issues in social media around brand safety and um, around the divisive, I'd say, the divisive nature of of some of the platforms. You know, as a as an as an agency, you know, WPP advises its clients on on how to spend the money, and it's up to the clients to decide, you know, how to do that. But a number of our clients uh, have either, you know, paused their spend with Facebook or taken other actions over the last few months. You know, I, I think that um, you know, we have had robust conversations and made it clear to all social media platforms that if they want to expect advertiser dollars, they have to provide a, a safe environment for our brands and and for consumers. And that does mean taking you know, more responsibility for the content on their platform and having policies that protect consumers and end up with a safe platform and then having procedures and processes to take down content that doesn't fit with those policies. I think that to some extent, um, you know, events have accelerated uh, demands by consumers and pressure groups and activists for changes both in the policies and in uh, the procedures people do to take down content. And I think there's a degree of frustration that um, these things are not happening quickly enough. You know, there continues to be hate speech on social media platforms. And I think people generally agree there should be no hate speech on, on social media platforms. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that um, the pressure on the platforms to change is understandable. And um, certainly, you know, we have... Uh, a lot of robust conversations with the platforms about the need to change and things that they do. We've been working with a global body called the Global Alliance for Responsible Media with the World Federation of Advertisers and a number of our clients to make clear what, what, what has to happen. Now, currently, this is a mainly um, a US issue, but I think to some extent it is a, a global issue and it's a careful balance uh, that the platforms have to take between you know, free speech, taking down hate speech, and moderating the content on their platforms and having the resources to do that. And I think that perhaps they've moved too slowly uh, in the past and haven't taken firm enough action. And so they're being caught out by these pressures. And, and I think that that's probably in the long run um, a, a good thing. No, I, I totally agree with you. I have one other question from the audience. I think you spoke about it, but maybe you might want to elaborate again. So this is from Anjan Mitra. He said, Mr. V, Reed, would you like to hazard a guess as to what the percentage drop would be on ad spends in the Indian market due to pandemic? Um, no, I, I don't want to hazard, <laughs> hazard a guess. I mean, we think we said it was sort of 5% in Q1. We're looking at a figure of, I guess, at the average of those three months, you know, 50, maybe 60% in Q2. You know, I would expect Q3 and Q4 um, maybe to be 30% in Q3 and a little bit less in Q4. But, you know, I'm really extrapolating from that. That is not a, an official forecast um, or in any way an expert forecast. But I think that we are seeing, you know, some recovery in, in economic activity. Yes, yes. Uh, but I think the uh, quarter two has been uh, very tough, as you said, compared. And I think the drop was is sharper in India as compared to many parts of the world, I think, in quarter two. And, and hopefully the recovery could even be uh, equal to pass. I think you know, that's, exactly. the, that's, that's the message. Um, if there are no further questions, uh, I was thinking this would also be one of the one of the great things about digital conferences is that we are starting on time and we are ending on time and in keeping with that i would like to take the opportunity to thank you mark but before that um i'd like to also use the couple of minutes we have to recap some of the things we talked about for the audience and then sort of you know leave behind a few a few messages which were very loud and clear as, as you know as we spoke and as, as you spoke very eloquently about many of those things so i think one uh, first message uh, is I think the big theme is digital and technology. 
So I think my my the first message which Mark has given is that you know most things will move digital and will be powered by technology, and therefore the world, the new normal, will have a, a sharper and an and a and a even higher indexation of digital than what we could have imagined pre-pandemic. This is a phenomena which was on, but it has got accelerated. It's got accelerated across sectors. And I don't think there would there would be any sector, if at all, which is immune to that. So I think the first is around digital. Think about your business, think digital, think technology, think how would you be able to drive some of those things as we go forward. I think the second related point is for media, particularly many of the media friends I have across uh, across the virtual room here, is that some of the spends which are going away from certain medium may not come back. I think if 2008, 2009 is anything to go by, Mark was categorical that that trend could continue to remain. And therefore, it's important that you start thinking of different mediums to continue to build your business. So the business we are in and that too being is, is invariably that of content will remain. But I think how we deliver it we need to think through. And I think that's an important message and something for many of us to think about. I think the third uh, interesting point was on consumer habits and consumer behavior. And I think when consumer habits, I think some of the things which will get accentuated, and I think that's important for brands, that's important for businesses, that is rather important for content as well, is around healthcare, around exercising, and around family. And also questioning the need to travel. So, you know, whether it is less business travel, we spoke about remote working, working from home. So I think this is very pronounced. And, and on a lighter way, barber shop is one I would like to visit as well, Mark, as you said, which is right on top of everyone's, of everyone's agenda, whereas restaurant may not be that much. So I think there were very specific points you also talked about. But the big points on consumer behavior is, is, is this, and which is, which is very important. I think the fourth point is we talked about in some questions as well is around trusted brands. I think the redefinition and therefore the, the, the role trust will play in building brands, I think is something I'd like to leave the audience with some of the brand marketers who may be in the audience and everyone else. All of us are in the business of brand once again. So I, in my opinion, so I think brands, we've got to build trusted brands. In an Indian context, there is also a, a, this thing about Indian brands, but more importantly, it's about trusted brand. This is also very closely linked to the social media context, which we were talking about, building trust there and therefore building even your social platforms, which have trust and therefore managing freedom of speech and, and, and some of the polarization and hate speech even more delicately and, and making sure that that is, that is the right thing to do as we go forward. I think the one fundamental phenomena on consumer behavior is, is around online. And if there was a secondary phenomena, is that's around connectivity. So if you when you think of consumer, think of consumer online. I think therefore that's an important piece. And I think therefore that's so online becomes very important. It becomes important across businesses again. It breaks down boundaries. Think of it as an opportunity because now world is your uh, is your market in in most of the cases particularly for media and entertainment and i think that is fantastic news for a country like india i think that message mark i think thank you for it i think it's a very important message on online but at the same time there is connectivity and that's why there is a bit of a polarization in type of content as well there will be premium high quality content which has the capacity to engage that audience in that country, but arguably audience anywhere in the world with subtitles today and language translations. But at the same time, there will also be social con content, which is user-made content, which will also engage particularly the youngsters, but arguably everyone. So I think that's the, uh, that, that, that is the piece which we need to continue to live with. Uh, with those thoughts, and once again, signing off on digital and technology on this e ikiki frames, I think it's the most appropriate thing to do. And my conversation with Mark Reed, I think who's a firm believer in technology, who's done a lot in terms of shifting WPP towards making them a technology-driven, data-driven, future-ready organization. And I think it was a great conversation. It was lovely talking to you, Mark. Thank you for your time. And look forward. And I was there when you were here in India and when we met yeah. you know, just a couple of, couple of weeks before the pandemic. Nobody would have thought 
how the next three months would play out. Uh, hopefully, I think that uh, the the recovery would also be as rapid, and we will never be able to anticipate on how we could all go go back to the new normal, so to say. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mark. It was a pleasure talking to you, and look forward to meeting you soon, uh, both in person and maybe virtually as we go forward. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being a wonderful audience and for your very very incisive and good questions. Um, and and have a great uh, Fiki Frames as you go forward. Enjoy yourself. And and make the most of the sessions ahead. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Mark, once again. Thanks, thanks very much, Dan Shu. And, and thank you, thank you, um, Dan Shu. Yeah, Mark, you were. Thank you, Dan Shu. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful session, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. We will now move on to the next session. Please give us five minutes, and we'll start the next session. Thank you, everybody.